All right, everyone, I'm hoping this works and you can hear me okay. I have the wires plugged in and I have the camera set. And we are on here. All right, let me kill the sound here. <laughs> I'm a little quicker. So what I did today, I'm streaming you through my iPhone because I haven't bought the PC yet. And I'm about to take a trip, so I, there's no time to deal with that before I leave town. But I wanted to catch you up on some things. I started to write my notes and didn't get very far. <laughs> but I know my topic. Uh, let me see what I can catch you up on. Um, first of all, my name is Mark Levinson. If you're new to my channel, I want to thank you for chiming in, or chiming in, yeah, conversing with us here. This is a great channel to learn a lot about the hobby and to be successful. Uh, right now, we have just crossed the 38,000 threshold. About 1,000 new people join this channel each month. And I, I, I appreciate that you're willing to follow along. I just got back from Las Vegas. I went there for a couple of days to film some promotional material for this coming MACNA. MACNA is going to be September 7th through 9th in uh, Las Vegas. And we're staying at the Westgate. So I stayed at the Westgate. I wanted to get the full impression of what it's like. And there, you're going to see some videos rolling out about that. That is coming very soon. Um, also, I met another or a fellow YouTuber. His name is Reef Dudes, which is funny because it's just one of them. And he promises to do a video about it since I asked him, who's the other dude? And he um, has a channel that has around 7,000 subscribers. I'm sure he'd love it if you were to follow his channel as well. I got to hang out with him and watch him film and do his thing. He got to see what I was doing. And um, he jumped off the top of the stratosphere. And I even filmed his jump, which was 855 feet straight down. Uh, by the way, in case you're wondering, it's about three seconds. Also, no, that's it. Uh, oh, yeah, one more topic, uh, because it's very fresh in my mind. And, you know, it's funny. I don't always pick topics for the live stream based on something happening to me. It could be something happening to you. And uh, in this case, I'm not getting into this yet, but I just want to touch on the fact that I installed the ATK on my 400-gallon reef. And... I am going to guess that it installs very easily on a normal size system, but with us with bigger tanks, it's a little more complicated. Uh, basically, we need the run time to be longer per dosing session or per, per top off session, I should say. And um, so, you know, I plugged it all in, hooked it all up, and you know, I got alarms and alerts. And I'm still trying to work out the kinks on that. But once I've had some time to really play with it, then I will definitely do a review on it as well. But I mean, I already own it. It's, it's what I'm going to use. It's replacing the smart ATO that I've run for the last three years. Um, okay, so palytoxin. I want to go into this because yet again, another story came up about someone who believes that they were poisoned by palytoxin. And palytoxin is inside many of our reef tanks. And at the same time, I've been in the hobby 20 years. I started getting the corals 16 years ago, I believe, maybe 17. And I actually have the exact poisonous coral in my tank since 2002. And I've never been affected by it. And you know how uh, in a lot of the movies, you know, like the murder movies, they um, always show a bad guy who has a big predator tank behind him and there's like a lionfish in there or there's a uh, dang it why can't i think of a, oh, a puffer uh the, apparently they have the stuff inside them and they used a syringe and they pulled out the poison and they killed their enemy so technically all of you with reef tanks probably have the ability to be on one of those tv shows or movies one day but uh i've never once thought what can i draw out of this coral and use to harm another human being i've also never thought Oh no, this coral is dangerous to me. I need to take ultimate precautions. It's never been a thing. But maybe it's because common sense runs deep with me and uh, it may not be so obvious to you. So we're gonna go into what to avoid and also uh, how to, uh, eh, I don't know. <laughs> Let's see where the conversation goes. That might be our best bet. First of all, um, in the community tab on the YouTube channel, I posted a picture of mine. I have had this exact type of pally, palythoa, SPP, which basically stands for species. Um, I've had that type in my tank, like I said, since I bought my 55 gallon. I bought it used, it came with them. I just put them, I, I took the tank down, I drug it home, I installed it, 
and I put the exact same corals back in, and they've been with me ever since. And they're not great. They're not gorgeous. They're basically brown, but when they get hit with the right lighting, they, uh, they have like a green, pretty, uh, they're really pretty. And yet they can exude a slime, and that slime or that mucus is what can get you. And if it's just sitting in your tank, it shouldn't do any harm. So I did some research. Of course, the first thing I did was I got my coral magazine and I noticed there was the topic, palytoxin. And this is the March, April edition of 2018. And in this one on page 72, I'm gonna try to avoid the reflections here from the lights. That is the article. And there are multiple pictures in here about different species of pallies and what to watch out for. This one looks a lot like the one I have. And you'll notice uh, these right here, it's funny. It says Daniel Knopp has these in this tank in Germany, yet they look like Texas trash pallies to me, which is kind of funny. We uh, can't stand them here. <clears throat> and here's a picture of them closed up on a rock. So basically, the typical toxic palithoa is the one that grows like a mat. And it's got continuous tissue, and then there's polyps sticking out of it. And when they close up or, they are, you know, their mouths shut, they, uh, you can see this continuous mat. And you could peel it off the rock uh, to remove it. What you don't want to do, you don't want to inhale the stuff. You don't want it in your eyes or your mouth, open cuts. But apparently, and I found a YouTube video, and when this video goes live, I will put links in the description to everything so you can go do follow-up research. But apparently, the mucus sitting on your skin can actually go into your bloodstream you know, or into your system, into your immune system, and affect you because it happened to Julian Sprung. And Julian Sprung is famous. I have some of his books right here over my shoulder, and yet he handled a rock. He basically picked up a rock of pallies and put them in a tank, and he didn't like it, so he put them in a different tank. And... Then uh, he, he didn't like the way the tank reacted. He thought, huh, that's weird. The coral is hurting these, this perfectly fine system. So he took it out and put it in a bucket, took him home, and threw him in a tank outside. And that night he became very sick. And he said all I did was touch the rock and there was no cuts on my hand. And, you know, he was super, super sick. So his video is about 36 minutes. I will be putting a link to that so you can listen along and see what he has to say. Very wise man, been in the hobby, I think he said 30 years, maybe longer. And yet, uh, and he never had a problem with the coral either. So technically, at some point, I will be doing a video about mine that I've had that have never bothered me. But he actually made an interesting premise. And that's the one, you know, I love trying to find one nugget of truth when I hear a presentation from a speaker. You know, I go there and a lot of times I know the topic and yet I wanna hear something new. I wanna learn something so I can feel like it was worth the 45 minutes I sat there, right? I mean, that's how I look at it. I try to always find the positive. And uh, he had made the premise, could it be that having that particular coral in your tank explain why sometimes in a seemingly totally happy tank, an SPS coral just goes up in smoke overnight? You know, we talk about RTN and STN, and we usually blame alkalinity, or we blame... Uh, lack of flow, or too much light, or not enough light, you know? And his point was that maybe this coral is exuding some slime. You know, it gets stressed and it affects SPS corals. And you'll see in his video, he lost a number of SPS corals to that coral that had only been in the tank for a minute or two. Very interesting premise. So uh, maybe that will be the future question when people say, my coral died, what should I do? Like, do you have any palithoa? So that's a very interesting thought. Um, yes, there's non-toxic and there is toxic palitho. There's some that are super strong. There's some that are less. Also, Julian made the point, uh, it was not in the article. The article is very, very good. And it talked about everything from a doctor's perspective. So if you're a subscriber to Coral Magazine, grab your magazine. If you're an e-subscriber, which means it's online only, which you can definitely do, you can read it that way. And worst case scenario, you can buy the back issue, which, you know, because now it's May going on June. This was the March-April edition. Technically, it's a $5 issue, and you can just buy it, have it you know, shipped to your door, and you can read it yourself. Uh, it would be kind of neat if one day I had a fireplace right here, and I just read a story to you, and I just read an article out of there. I'm sorry about that. I just got a phone call during the stream. I hope we keep going, and it doesn't break the stream too badly. Uh, green button polyps are definitely the type of, uh, or sand polyps is what they're also called. 
It's definitely the type of zoa that can get you. But apparently, palytoxin does exist in other zoanthids as well. And one of the things I started to say before, Julian had mentioned that a long time ago, palythoa was considered the larger polyp, and then zoanthid was a smaller one. And he says, technically, in the scientific world, that's not true. They're all zoanthus. And uh, pallies are a very specific thing, but you know, scientists know it and hobbyists debate it. So we do need to be cautious around them. So let me go into what you, you should never, ever, ever do. And I've been telling this to people for years. I don't understand who came up with this idea, thought it was smart, and I don't understand why it's caught on and why everyone does it. But stop doing it, okay? Stop scrubbing your rock. That solves nothing ever, never. And all of those of you that watch this now during the live stream or later during playback, and you're, you're going to tell me, oh, it's fine and I did it. Stop doing it, okay? Stop telling people to scrub rock. That is not the way to clean rock. I don't recommend it. I never have. I think it makes no sense at all. And apparently it's a health risk based on what I've just been doing in my research, um, which, like I said, I have this degree of common sense in my skull that tells me what to do and what not to do, and I tend to listen to it. And when I had a rock covered with hair algae, I knew scrubbing it was not going to solve it because it's going to release the crap everywhere. That crap's going to land everywhere else and start growing everywhere else. So no, that's a bad idea. Much better to cook your live rock um, in salt water in a covered container where it gets no light and let it just uh, simmer for like two to six months. Okay, I know it's a long time, but if you're buying a used setup and it came a bunch of live rock, it costs you nothing to take all their rock and throw it in a barrel with salt water power head, put the lid upside down. And what I mean is like if you have a trash can, they have that dome lid Take the lid, flip it upside down. So now it's this way. And as water comes onto the surface, it condenses onto the surface. Uh, it'll just drip back down. You don't even have to top off the barrel. You can basically just let it sit in the corner, plug in a large pump, like a mag pump, and let it just circulate the water all the time. And you know, every so often, change the water. That also will be a link in the description because I've done that video already about cooking live rock. And there's a picture of me putting a rock in a pot on the stove, and that's to say, never ever do this. It's ironic, um, and some people apparently think it's okay to do. Do not boil your rock. Do not pressure wash your rock. Do not scrub your rock. Uh, what else? Do not laser your pallies. I mean, <laughs> these are all the things that people have been doing. Uh, you know, the laser is a lot more newer. Um, but everything else they've been doing, and they're getting themselves sick. And every time I see that story, you know, I always read the story to see if the facts are straight, number one. And number two, I kind of internally roll my eyes because I just feel like, stop doing that. Uh, ah. Okay, so what spawned this live stream was about a week ago, I was contacted, no, maybe two weeks ago, I was contacted by a friend who said he had a rock, like a, a, a bridge that had been covered with pallies. He took it out of his tank and put it outside. And it had been in the weather, it had been in the snow, it had been frozen, everything else. And a guy wanted to buy this rock from him for his aquarium. And then he took the, uh, the he, he told the customer, you know, the person buying the rock, the hobbyist, do not put this rock in your tank. You need to put it in a saltwater vat and you let it circulate for weeks on end and, you know, let the stuff that's on the rock that's died fall off, you know, basically. And the guy apparently did not listen to this advice and just put it right in his tank. And in the end, his dog died, his cat got sick, his daughter was very sick, he was in the ER, um, multiple days with issues, and... The doctors apparently are saying it's palytoxin, but everyone else is saying that it was carbon monoxide poisoning. And that, you know, apparently nothing I read about palytoxin mentioned rising levels of monoxide in your bloodstream. And I'm, if I'm saying that wrong, that's fine. I didn't memorize it, okay? I'm just sharing third hand what I read. But, um, or is that second hand? <laughs> Uh, but they were saying that the, the levels rise when you have palytoxin. That's not in anything I read. It talked about flu-like symptoms, fever, shaking, weakness. Those are the things it talked about. It also mentioned how you could have, uh, it could affect your heart rate. Um, one person specifically was mentioned to have had a heart attack. Um, one person that was very ill in the article was put in a coma for a few days. Be, to, uh, to stop the spread of the problem and to kind of find a cure or find a solution to what was going on with him. Um, and, you know, they, 
Like with every single medicine you ever see on TV and they list all the things that can happen to you, you know, they even say, and death. So death could happen. I am not aware of anyone dying from palytoxin. Humans. Uh, I just told you about a dog that died. So how did these animals and this family get so sick from a rock he put in his tank? How would that happen? Um, in, his ex in his experience of what he described, and we only know what he told us, and we don't know anything beyond that, he said he took the rock and he put it in the tank, but as he handled the rock, it cut him. So now it seems logical that some of that stuff on the rock got into his bloodstream. You know, he's putting in one rock, he's putting in two rocks, he's putting in ten rocks, he's stacking the rock work, he's got an injured hand, and it's getting his bloodstream. Somehow his eye got badly affected. Usually that happens when something squirts you in the eye. Um, his own words were, the hand that was injured, I then rubbed my eye. So the infection got into his eyeball. So that was his experience as he's described it. I don't know medically if that was exactly the case. Kind of makes sense that the injury tied to the eye would do it. Anytime you're working with an aquarium and you are handling rock, there's a risk you'll get nicked. It just happens. You can wear gloves, but it's very hard to work in a reef tank with gloves because you can't feel. We're very tactile and we're trying to make sure we're doing things correctly. And when your hand is, you know, muffled by a glove, you have uh, less of a, you're just more clunky. You're more clumsy <laughs> because you're not able to feel things as it's happening. So you could wear gloves. You can wear the thicker surgical gloves. You can go crazy with the really crazy thick gloves like you find at Harbor Freight or you buy them online from Marine Depot or these other companies. Uh, you can do that. I've done it occasionally, but usually I don't like to. I, I just go in with my hands. I'm old school. Uh, but I've never had any kind of a medical issue handling my tank, and I hope I never do. Now, as soon as I'm done handling anything, I go to the sink and I rinse my hands off. I do it all the time. If I'm doing something every uh, very immersive, and I feel like I've really gotten some crap on my hands, I get out the soap, you know, I get out the Dawn or whatever, and I wash my hands to get whatever's off. The other thing you have to think about is towels. And this is something that people forget about. They're, they have a towel right by their aquarium. They're working in the tank, they dry off their hands. You know, they work in the tank, they dry off their hands. They work in the tank, they dry off their hands. And then they get splashed and they take that towel they've been drying off their hands and they wipe their face. And suddenly their tongue goes numb or their eyes are twitching or some, things like that because the stuff was on the towel. So have a stack of towels. Dry off your hands, throw the towel on the floor. Next towel, throw the towel on the floor. You know, that kind of thing. Always have a fresh towel. Don't touch your face whatsoever when you're working in your tank. If um, you're using paper towels, you can just throw them away as you're working too. That's another way. Or be aware of what you're doing. If you get something on your face, take a break, go get cleaned up, fresh towels, and then resume. So the articles have mentioned wearing eye protection. I wear glasses, so I'm kind of cheating. You know, I have some protection built in all the time. Lucky me. Um, they talk about face protection, like a, a breathing mask, so you don't inhale. I'm going to go into all of that right now. So here's the next part. If you're fragging corals, if you're handling these corals, and you're taking them out of the tank and putting them in the tank, there are different things we hobbyists do. Sometimes we glue the coral to a frag plug. So you're, you've got your frag plug, you've got your drop of glue, you're picking up your frag and you're pressing it on top. And as you're pressing and holding it, you may even squeeze the coral slightly and just squirts you right in the face. It can happen. It can squirt that way too. Hopefully it'll squirt that way. But if it squirts towards your face, you know, are you holding corals too close to your face when you work, number one? So can you pull it away from yourself so that way you're a little safer? And you want to be very careful that your mouth isn't hanging open. I don't know why people are mouth breathers, but when you're working around a tank, purse your lips. Just <laughs> Keep your mouth shut so nothing gets in. If something gets on your cheek, don't freak out. Get your fresh clean towel, blot yourself off. If you want to, like I said, take a break. Go clean up head to toe <laughs> if you feel the need. Uh, you know, Normally I'll just go to the sink, rinse everything off that was affected slightly, and I go right back to what I was doing. Now, what if you're using a bandsaw and you're cutting corals? So you've got your, and you've seen my bandsaw video. I did a video about the griffin, right? So you're pushing the coral through this very thin blade. The blade's doing this. Water is kind of squirting out and it's cutting. And as you cut a coral, as the coral's being sliced, it's uh, releasing a mucus 
and that mucus is getting into the water that the blade is spinning through. So it's sending out, uh, I'm wanting to use the word micro, micro moisture into the air. And you're breathing that air in, even if it's just through your nose, because you get your mouth pursed shut. And so as the mist is hitting you, it can affect you. It can make you sick because you're inhaling it. You're inhaling, you're aerosolizing that uh, palytoxin or any other coral mucus for that matter. So you want to make sure that you're not letting any of that stuff happen. Hang on, let me close a couple things, keep showing on my screen. Um, bandsaw, bad. Uh, oh, tile saw would do the same thing. It's a spinning blade, there's water flying. And if you're working indoors, the air is even more uh, condensed and we want to have lots of fresh air. So if ideally, you take your corals outside and you do it where you're around fresh air, but you still have to think about what you're breathing. So if you want to be very cautious, or if you are, oh man, do I want to call you a hypochondriac? <laughs> if you're really scared, then do the most protection you can think of, you know, protect yourself all over, you know, wear, a, wear a, uh, an apron and, you know, wear the face mask, wear the face shield, you know, wear the gloves and work very cautiously. And then you'll peel everything off like a surgeon. They throw it all away and they get it all cleaned up. Uh, that's what you can do. I've never felt the need to be that extreme, but I am thinking and I am being careful and I am being cautious. So these things I've described to you so far, handle a coral, get your hands out of the tank. As soon as your hands are out of the tank, go rinse off. That's what I do. If I do it a hundred times, I mean, I've never counted, but I bet I do it a lot. I don't rinse my hands like I'm OCD, but I rinse my hands. I like my hands clean. And a, a funny story, um, my, my son, when he was very small, he fell down in the dirt and got his hands dirty and he freaked out that his hands were dirty. And uh, you know, we always tease him about that ever since that, you know, to this day. And it was just a one-time moment in his life, you know, and he was a little tiny kid. <laughs> but for some reason it resonated with us. And for me, I, I don't know, I like my hands clean. And so I'm constantly rinsing them off. It's just a regular routine I do. And, I go through a lot of towels here at my house. Now, let's say you have palytoxin in your tank. You know, you're moving corals, the corals are sliming, and there's just this stuff, you know it's in the system. You, you know for a fact that you have aggravated it, you have awoken the beast. What can you do to make the water safe? What can that guy do that has a tank full of toxic liquid that affected his entire household to where everyone had to leave? Um, and interestingly, in that story that he shared, he said, that no one would go in and clean it up. The fire department wouldn't do it. Uh, the CDC wouldn't do it. The CDC would not do it. Every movie I've ever seen, the CDC shows up. They put up barriers. They put up warnings. They're all in full body suits. And they go in and they extract. Or they, and here's the thing that always gets me. Uh, it's a nuclear fallout, right? And they take a brush and they brush off the human being with water. I'm like, that's your cure for radiation poisoning? Brush me off? Anyway, that's what they do in the movies. Uh, this guy said no one will go into his house. They're terrified. Uh, I'm, okay, I said terrified. He didn't say that, <laughs> quote, quote. But um, the thing is, is that to get the palytoxin out of your tank, you need to run carbon. So I would fill up a reactor with pelletized carbon, pelletized activated carbon, GAC. Uh, no, I'm sorry, G is granulated. I want pelletized, so PAC? And you want to put that in a reactor, I would probably in that situation use twice as much as normal. So normally we use half a cup per 50 gallons. At this point, I would say one cup per 50 gallons to get the stuff out of the water. And according to the article in this coral issue, this coral magazine issue, it said that running granulated activated carbon on a tank reduced the palytoxin level measured in the tank, I think it said 97.9%. So almost 98% was removed just running carbon overnight for 12 hours or so. Now, if you need to kill everything, and I mean, that's it, it is the nuclear decision, then you pour bleach in the tank. And basically it's gonna be 10 to one. <clears throat> so 10 parts water, one part bleach, and you just bleach everything. It's destroyed, nothing lives. And you know now you can get rid of the water, which I would probably at that point, the bleach water would go down the toilet. I wouldn't put in the yard. Um, I would want to go down the sewer line and uh, let the city deal with it. 
I'm going to get a call from the city for this video. <laughs> How dare you tell people to put palytoxin? No, uh, the carbon absorbs it. So, matter of fact, the carbon went up in the landfill. So, there you go. I can still hear this thing. Hang on, turn it all the way down. All right. <clears throat> um, all right, it, let me see. If, has there been any important questions I've missed? Are you guys answering for me? Because I've been focused on talking to you about what's going on here. Okay, one person asked, could you run your tank water through an RODI filter? No, nope, that won't work. Number one, you have to pressurize it to get it around 75 PSI. And that's going to be tricky. And then secondarily, it's salt and all the other crap that's in there, and the filters would clog up very fast. It is not the way to cure a tank. You basically do water changes. You remove. Remember the, the old saying, dilution is the solution to pollution. So if your tank is polluted, do big water changes. Do a 50%, do a 70%, do a 90%. You know, change a whole bunch of water. Make sure that your, your salinity, your temperature, and your pH all match, and you can change as much water as you want. In the case of this guy with this toxic tank, turn off the protein skimmer. You know, you knew something was wrong with this tank because he showed a picture of the sump, and it was filled with foam. And what he had done, like I said, he took all this rock, and he put it inside the, uh, the tank, turned on the skimmer, and the skimmer wasn't even doing anything. It was the body of the sump was just filled with foam, like somebody had poured Dawn you know, dishwasher uh, solution in there, so, or detergent. And that's, that's a problem. So when you see that kind of stuff... Think about it, you know, something's not right with your system. You need to remove it. You need to scoop it out or capture it in a sock or uh, swipe it off with a sponge. Clean yourself up. I'm going to keep saying clean yourself up. That's a very important rule. All right. All right. Um, okay. If you have any questions, now's the time to ask because I ignored the chat box. I apologize. But I, I wanted to get to this. It's just I need you guys to be careful with this stuff, but I don't want you to be scared of it because there's lots of beautiful zoanthids out there, and we all love them. Lots of people buy them. There's a lot of collectors. There's a lot of fraggers. Matter of fact, if I had had the time, I would have called a, a friend of mine in, in uh, Florida who, who's famous for zoanthids and see what kind of fears he has around this stuff. Sometimes, you know, accidents will happen, and you could end up being sick. Most people, the symptoms from palytoxin is a brief, very unpleasant duration. Um, headaches, uh, fever, uh, some pain in your back possibly, um, hard time breathing, fits of coughing. These are the things that usually affect you. And of course, you know, you freak out and you go straight to the ER and then the ER has no idea what to do with you because it's not that prevalent. It doesn't happen all the time. But there has been a lot of cases. Um, see, the problem is every time a case is... Um, let's say submitted or, or you know they go to a hospital and you know hospital makes a report they don't always identify the correct uh diagnosis and they might say upper respiratory infection when it really was palytoxin or they might say palytoxin but they don't really know because it's so unique uh, it's not common but there has been a lot more cases than again that one guy that was posting on facebook he said there's only been eight cases in the world and that's not true i'd say it's been 30 to 40 to 50 in the last 20 years so there's been quite a few, um, but there's been, they say at any given time, there's about 100,000 saltwater hobbyists in the U.S. I don't know how they guess that number, but let's just say it's true. 100,000 in the U.S., and let's say there's been 20 cases of palytoxin poisoning in the last uh, 10 years, okay? So the odds of you getting this are slim. But it's not impossible, and you could do something that would be unwise. So think about what you're doing. Douglas, do not throw the people off with your random comments like that one. <laughs> He's talking about um, dihydrogen monoxide. So scary. If you ever Google that, uh, it's this huge spoof of a page. It's warning everyone that we're using water and we should stop. <laughs> all right uh what one person said at what point or level of stress do the palates and zoas exude this the, or expel this toxin does it happen when something just crawls over it or does it happen you know when you're handling it and fragging it uh yes the thing is that you can affect you can make this happen by handling it like in this case julian was breaking down a tank he reached into the bottom of the tank and he pulled this coral out and he just put in another tank the water may not have been the exact same, 
and so the coral reacted. Then he took it out of the tank because he didn't like the look, and he put it in another tank. So basically, let's just call it manhandling, even though I don't think he was being that rough with it. I think, you know, he's doing what any of us would have done, which is pick it up, put it over there, pick it up, put it over here. But it keeps hitting new water, different temperature, different salinity. I mean, there's slight variances. No one has all identical tanks. It just never happens. And so that little bit was enough to cause this coral to stress and release some of the mucus or the gel. And he, he saw enough of it that was on his hand. And he thought nothing of it. He just cleaned off his hand, and then later he was sick. So that's when he discovered it could go right through your skin, even though there was no breaks in the skin. And that's usually not been um, believed. You know, we've always thought he had to have a cut, had to have a nick, something for it to enter. But will just a, uh, a crab crawling across it affect it? No. Very unlikely. So I wouldn't worry about that one. Mm. All right. Let's see. That's my big topic. I don't even need this topic to be long or the stream to be long. I just wanted to get to the point so that way you guys would know what to do. Basically, don't breathe it. Don't taste it. Oh, yeah. That was another thing. People that have had palytoxin enter their system get a metallic taste in their mouth. So that's something good to remember, try to remember. If somebody says, I, I have palytoxin poisoning, you can ask them, do you taste something metallic in your mouth? You know, it, it would be a good check point you know just to, you know, you're going down the list of things do you have this do you have this do you have this that way you can help them identify if they actually do or if it's something totally unrelated um by the way uh this was considered the second most deadliest poison in the world no one ever said what the first one was so if you know it feel free to tell me uh, i was curious but i didn't google it uh, i have no idea all right what else Okay, so I'm going to change topics. I mean, I'll watch for your questions. I'm just going to talk. Uh, while I was out of town in Vegas, my AC decided to conk out. And, you know, my reef relies on the house being a certain temperature. And so when I got home at 2.30 in the morning, yesterday morning, you know, 36 hours ago or whatever it is. Um, well, yeah, 36 hours ago exactly, <laughs> according to that clock. Uh, my house was at 76 degrees, and I always keep my house at 73. And the humidity was up to 70%, and my house is usually lower than that. And so I thought, that's strange, and I put my hand up to feel the vent, and it didn't feel cold. I mean, it felt all right, but it didn't feel good. And outside was 84 degrees, and my house was, you know, 76. <laughs> and I thought, oh. So, you know, I called the phone number, middle of the night, and I, you know, because I have a service. And I told them, I said, the AC is going out. I need you guys to come out here. I live here. I work here. Just show up. I'm here. And, uh, you know, then I tried to go to sleep, but I couldn't because I was uncomfortable. So I opened a couple of windows to let some air blow through the house, which barely helped. And uh, when I woke up, you know, I called them and said, so did you get my message? And I'm like, yeah, but you didn't answer your phone when we called. <laughs> All right, I'm here. So anyway, a guy came out to my house. I'd say it was around 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and he spent five hours solving the problem. And he got the temperature of my house down. Now, the reason I'm telling you this whole story is because my tanks <clears throat> rely on a lower temperature. I don't run chillers. I've never had a chiller in 20 years. I haven't felt the need to have a chiller because I keep the house comfortable for me. And if I'm comfortable, the reef is comfortable. That's how it works. That's how I look at it. My goal is not to have this super perfect temperature tank and my house be unpleasantly warm. I like being cool. Uh, I do not like being hot. I, I can't stand it. So I uh, knew to turn off the metal halides yesterday all day long. Just leave them off. So I just let the XHOs light the tank. So basically it was, it was in dusk mode from the moment the lights came on all the way till nightfall. And the tank maximized or you know the, the highest point the temperature rose is 81.6. Now point of reference, my apex is programmed to turn off the lights if the tank hits 82 degrees to stop adding heat. And uh, if the tank gets to 82.3, it turns off heaters. It turns, I mean, it just turns off anything that could be possibly adding heat to the tank to slow the rate of rise of temperature in the tank. And that's been programmed like that forever. I mean, 10 years. And it's always worked. It, it's great. Matter of fact, the beauty of having your tank turn off the lights at a certain threshold of temperature is visually, it gives you a clue something's going on with the tank. 
if your tank is just rocking and rolling and you're sitting there watching a movie right next to it and it's just slowly boiling away and you don't even notice because you don't look at it you know you're watching the movie having the lights turn off is a great indicator of what's going on over there that's weird and you can see everything's flowing and yet the lights are off and so then you look up on your phone or you look on the screen or you open a browser and you, or you walk over to the tank and look at the thermometer and it'll show the tank temperature is too hot and that way your livestock will not be affected adversely you can deal with it so my tank was fine i never once in a million years thought my frag system would ever get hot not even slightly first of all it's got led lights it's got you know a vectra pump that puts out no heat for the return it's got a you know, at this point it's got that uh somatic skimmer this is 18 watts of power which means no heat you know with a sit pump so i didn't even think about that tank at all and i'm I was miserable, hot in the house. Okay, so at this point, he's working on the, the AC. The house is 82 degrees inside. The tank's 81.6, winning. Um, but I'm trying to watch TV because I can't do anything else. I, I just can't stand it. I told you, I like it to be cool in here. And I realize there are lots of people that deal with heat and they work in the heat all day long. Well, there's a reason my career is inside an air-conditioned uh, environment. It's because I like it that way. And so it's 82, I'm miserable. I'm watching TV, and as I'm watching TV, I watch the refugium light under the frag system turn on and off, and then on and then off. And I was like, that's weird. It's acting like the frag system is too hot. So I open up the Apex, and I look on Fusion on my, in the app on my phone, and it says that that tank is 82.7. I was like, what? How is that tank getting hot? That makes no sense. And I know, yes, the tank is 80, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the, the house is 82 degrees, so it makes sense the water would match the, the temperature of the house. But I was very surprised to see that tank get hot. Now that tank doesn't have a cooling fan. I put a, a cooling fan on the main reef, which affects the anemone cube and keeps all of that the same temperature. But the frag system, I never thought that tank would ever be warm. So. I'm going to have to add a cooling fan to it so that way the apex can turn on that fan as needed for that aquarium. I was really shocked. Uh, it actually got to um, 82.9 was the highest. So 83 degrees. It's pretty hot. Just so you know, if your tank gets to 85 degrees, oxygen levels plummet and your fish will uh, they'll start being oxygen deprived, especially if you have a deep sand bed. Deep sand beds suck up the oxygen really quickly. So when you have a tank that's running really hot, you know, there's an accident, something goes wrong, your AC goes out, you can add an air stone to pump oxygen into the tank. Get yourself a big pump, hook it up to a big ceramic air stone. And the reason I say ceramic is those drop to the bottom of the tank and stay there. If you use just a regular, like a wooden air stone, they float at the surface. So here you are trying to put an air just bubbling up here. It's doing very little for the tank, but you can air stone down low, a ceramic one you can dangle in the tank. It's, the air is rising. And the fish, I don't, I don't know, the fish may even swim closer to it to get some air. Uh, I had to do it once before a long time ago, and I didn't watch the fish. I just knew get oxygen in the tank. And I put the air stone right in front of the vortex. So the, you know, the bubbles are coming out, a lot of them, and the vortex blew the bubbles across the reef. So air was going everywhere. Also, I took the collection cup off the skimmer that day, so it would just foam over like a volcano, thinking more oxygen, and I pumped fresh air into the fish room like crazy with a giant floor fan to bring in outside hot air, but it was air, and I just thought, Let me, I gotta do something, and it was what I did, and nothing suffered, so it worked out. But uh, yeah, we wanna keep our tanks cooler, we wanna have alerts to let us know when they're getting too warm, and apparently I need an alert for that frag system to tell me the tank temperature is too hot. I'll have to make a, an update to the settings. And I need to add a fan to it. But, you know, the AC is back to normal. The reason I have a, a warranty till 2038 or whatever it is, yeah, it's to keep it running no matter what. And, you know, they understand. You know, they, the guy showed it because I heard you're going to love me. I was like, yeah, knock yourself out. Go do it. And he worked on it. All right. Any more palytoxin questions come up while I was chatting about other things? I just uh, un unhit a message that had the F word in it. Sorry, guys. Ah, uh, someone says the cone shell. Cone snail? I don't know. Um, we'll have to Google it and see what we have to say about that. One more thing about cooling I might as well mention since I've been talking about that is that I noticed, you know, remember I did a video about two weeks ago where I talked about uh, using small fans to cool your reef and I happened to look under my tank, and it seems like every time I looked under my tank, the fan would twitch. And I thought, oh. 
and I was just in my brain, you know, just mentally, I wasn't really thinking about it, but I kind of just assumed that the cooling fan had just stopped at the moment I walked up. But I noticed it twitch every time. Started thinking, okay, the odds of me always getting there right as it turns off are slim to none. So I reached down there and I kind of messed with it and it wouldn't come to life. And I looked at the apex and it said fan on, but the fan wasn't spinning. So I had to replace my fan. So if you do have cooling fans, please do take a look at them. Make sure they're all operating correctly. Make sure they're blowing the correct direction. Um, I, I do recommend blowing down uh, onto the water. That's the best way to cool your tank. And uh, make sure that they turn on and off at the times you've, pro you've uh, programmed. So. All right. I just banned that guy, Mandrake. Problem solved. That's why I was busy being quiet for a moment. I was like, what is this? <laughs> All right, ask your question. Now's your chance. And then we're going to wrap this up. It's already uh, been 42 minutes. Dino, or Dino, could be Dino, said that um, he just got some zoanthids shipped to himself today, and they've been for shipping for eight hours, and, you know, the temperature probably changed during transport. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's not really a question. <laughs> you just received some zoanthids, and you acclimated them, and you're fine. You're, you're in there. No, I've never been poisoned by palytoxin. Not, a, not at all. Kitty, you'll catch up on the whole video later and you'll hear everything I had to say because this whole uh, live stream is then saved to the channel and you can watch the whole conversation. That sounds good. Dino, you did the right thing. You wore gloves. Um, I watched one guy. I've mentioned this once before in a previous video. Uh, we were doing a fragging workshop and part of the learning how to frag was to frag the zoanthids. And I watched this guy do it and he wasn't thinking about what he was doing or he was brand new, whatever it was. And I'm not making, as a matter of fact, I don't mention his name, so it doesn't matter. I can say whatever I want. But the, the thing is, he wore rubber gloves, and he put the frag in his palm, and he held a scalpel, and he was about to cut them in half across his palm. It's like, your palm is not a cutting board. And I made him put it on something solid, you know, and then cut on that. Do not use your hand when you're cutting, okay? Very important. No, you have nothing to worry about, Dino. If you had had anything happen to you, it would have happened already. This palytoxin is something you um, feel within mere hours of the last thing you did. So if you were handling zoanthids, if you were working around your tank, if you got into your elbows you know, with this stuff, then in a couple hours you're going to start feeling sick and sicker and sicker. It's going to be very obvious. You wouldn't be typing on a live stream you know, the next day or so and saying, hey, you know, am I okay? Yeah, you're fine. All right. Last question, somebody ask a good one. Go wash your hands, Dino, you'll be fine. Um, Shane, yes, that is coming soon. I want to buy some more parts from Marine Depot for that video, and uh, I just need to make the time to place the order, get the stuff here, and then get that video going. Uh, I don't want to waste any more of your time. Guys, I hope you have a great weekend. Make sure you test your water today. We all test our water on Saturday, and then we post our results. I like to post them to Instagram. Uh, you can save all your data in the Reef Trace app. Oh, yeah, that was the other thing I want to mention that was not on my list. Uh, last weekend, I released a very short video of Reef Trace, one feature of what it can do, because it had a new, you know, it had been updated, and there was some negative response to it. 
uh, and it's because you didn't understand. And odds are you're not even going to get to this point of the video and hear this, but I'm going to tell it to those of you that are listening. In the meantime, Reef Trace has sent me probably, I don't know, let's just imagine six or ten more very short clips. And I'm going to narrate each of these to explain how to use the app and then make a playlist on this YouTube channel to where you can learn all the functions of the app. Because I've had a few people say, is there any tutorials for this app? You know, it's great, but I wish I knew more, or I wish I knew if it did this, or does it do this, or why won't it do that? So I'm planning to work on all those little clips, and I'll just keep adding them to the channel, and that way you get the entire uh, effect of what you can do with this app. It, it is available for Android as well as for iPhone or, or Apple, and uh, it's $3.99, so the price is locked in now, which is great. So that will come out you know, as time permits. I'm about to take a one-week personal vacation, and uh, when I'm gone for that, you know, I'm just going to vanish. There will not be a live stream next Saturday because of that vacation. I'm spending time with family, and family comes first. So I got to do that. And um, other than that, please test your water. Post your results. Uh, if you're doing it on Instagram like I like you to, then do hashtag water testing, hashtag post your results, and you can do an at me loves reef so I get to see it. Make sure that your results are posted publicly because if it's private, there's no point sharing because no one can see it because it's private. So, you know, your Instagram shouldn't be private. Why is it private? What's on there that's so secretive? It's social media for a reason. And if you need to reach me, at me loves reef works everywhere. Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, that's it. I mentioned a couple weeks ago I have something in the works that is coming out very soon. And it is still in the works, and it's gaining momentum. I'm excited about it. And as soon as it is locked in stone, I'm telling you all about it. So that will be exciting. Uh, final push for Mac and I might as well since I just came back from Vegas. Look, Las Vegas mug. Um, Macna is taking place in Las Vegas this September, and if you are not signed up yet, you definitely want to you want to go, and uh, you gotta go. You gotta go. It's educational. All the things I tell you about, you could learn, and you could never you would never have to go to my channel again. <laughs> you'd learn it all in a weekend, and you'd be super smart, and your reef tank would be amazing, and it wouldn't just be a bunch of rock with a few frags. It would be a rocking reef. So I definitely I tell everyone go to Macna. Some people go. And they're like, wow, I had no idea. And other people don't go, and it's because they have no idea. But Macna is great, and I highly recommend it to everyone because you get three immersive days. It's like reef keeping college, and you graduate in three days flat. And you know, it's gonna cost you some money to go there. You gotta pay. Oh, the hotel is the cheapest hotel we've had in years, and the cheapest hotel will be in future years. It's 114 a night which usually it's like more like 140 a night or 150 a night. So 114 a night is fantastic. This is the 30th Macna in a row. This will be my 17th in a row to attend. My first one was in 2002 and I've never missed one since. There's going to be about 160 vendors there. So corals and equipment. Uh, you have the opportunity to buy both while you're at the show and bring them home to your tank. And, uh, I'll be speaking on one of the days. I believe I'm speaking on Saturday. I'll have to double check that one. And it'll be about setting up a saltwater tank because that's what I know how to do. So if you're, if you're watching this channel and you haven't set one up yet, come in person to Macna and you can hear the presentation. You can ask your questions in person. Uh, the speakers are always there to help you be uh, uh, more better informed. And at the end of every talk, there's always a 15-minute uh, Q&A period where anyone in the audience can ask questions and get them answered immediately on the spot. And of course you can ask questions afterwards as people are walking around the showroom floor. You can ask every vendor about their product, you know, what they're selling, how it works. You might own their product. And you're gonna start seeing some Macna videos rolling out. Some of the footage I shot in Vegas, plus some of the footage from last year that I never released. It's kind of funny. I wanted to release it. I ran out of time or steam or whatever the excuse is. And I thought, well, these would be great teasers for the future uh, Macna coming up. So in a way, the, there's still a benefit to having that footage. So you'll see that coming up soon. I do want to recommend that you um, really think about going. If you can do it, it'd be great. Usually about 2,500 to 3,000 people do it every year. And this year, because it's the 30th anniversary, there's 30 speakers, which is crazy. That's roughly 10 a day. That is a lot. But you can pick the topics you like and go attend that. And then when you're done, you just leave. And uh, this is kind of cool. 
So the reception on Friday night will be around the pool outside of the Westgate. You know, it's a really nice pool area with covered cabanas and all that kind of stuff. And it'll be, um, you know, I'm going to say open bar. I don't know. It, there'll be a bar there. You can get your liquor. And there will be, you know, all kinds of snacks and finger foods. And there will be a band called Live Rock, which is awesome. And the players in, uh, is it players? The players in the band? Uh, I'm saying that wrong, I'm sure. Uh, anyway, the band members are all industry people. So it's cool that they brought these people together to create this band called Live Rock. I love that. And what does that mean? Will they be playing 70s rock? I don't know, but I love the idea and I think it'll be a lot of fun. So we can look forward to that. Um, Saturday night, they're still discussing who will be the keynote speaker, and that is the big banquet. And that means your dinner is part of your Macna package. So, I mean, you definitely want to sign up for that. If you are not a, uh, if you're not a package guy and you just want to do one day, you can buy day passes. But, uh, God, you're cutting out so much you could learn. I just tell everyone, just commit. Just go all three days. And, you know, relax. Take your time. Don't be in a hurry. And just absorb knowledge as it happens all around you. You know, it'll just come at you from every angle, whether it's conversation at the bar, uh, people walk, you know, standing in the elevator telling stories to each other, you know, just... Plus, if you're a gambler, there's a casino. So you can spend some time trying to double your money to buy more raffle prizes to win more goods for your aquarium. I will definitely be buying raffle tickets. And when I do, I will be buying, or I'll be putting those tickets in the boxes for things I already own that I want to have backups of. That's what I do every year. And if I can get an extra Vortec, if I can get an extra skimmer, if I can get an extra light, I'll do it. I mean, why not? It's better than having to buy it again. Uh, all right, guys. Thank you so much for sticking through this entire live stream. If you have any kind of zoanth in your tank, please be careful. Do not lick them. I said that in my fragging video a while back. Again, Great weekend. Bye-bye.